I'm continuing my series on the 10th world champion, Boris Spassky. And I'm going to show you a classic Sicilian hack. Don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe. And do consider supporting us on Patreon or PayPal. So here we go. This game was played in 1962 in the Chess Olympiad. Spassky has the white pieces and he faces Klaus Dago, who was playing for the West German team. Open Sicilian, and it's a time on off variation, a very respectable line for black. And here Spassky plays a3. Now, normally if my students play a move like that, then I'm wagging my finger. I don't like these little short pawn moves at the side of the board. But actually, in this case, this one has a lot of points. So it stops bishop b4, which can be a bit annoying with that pin. But also, if the bishop comes to d3, then it can stop knight b4. And also, if the pawn comes to b5, then the pawn on a3 stops pawn to b4, or, or at least sort of minimizes the, the effect. So b5 anyway, and Spassky chooses to play bishop b2, and this could well lead into a kind of Scheveningen position. But Daga keeps it along Taimanov lines by putting the bishop to b7 straight away and developing the queen side rather than developing the king side pieces f4, and after knight f6, the bishop comes to f3. So the bishop is able to support that e4 pawn. So preventing any problem there with the knight and the bishop. That's now nicely supported. d6, and castles kingside. And here, bishop e7, you could say, is the most respectable move. But instead, Daga continues to play on the queen side. And, and this is very, very ambitious because the knight wants to land on the c4 square, attacking the bishop and, of course, attacking the pawn on b2. And here is where both sides have to start playing very precisely. And Spassky comes up with a really nice move, queen e2, which looks very straightforward, but this already involves a lot of calculation. So Daga continues with knight c4, hitting b2, looking at the bishop as well. But Spassky had prepared pawn to e5. So now the tactic starts and there is no substitute for calculation here. So first things first, what happens if pawn takes pawn? Well, this would be a mistake. Then you can take on b5. The knight attacks the queen. And the problem is that queen has to keep hold of the bishop as well as the knight. And after, let's say, queen d7, queen c4, well, white has one. Uh, well, one pawn anyway. So let's go back. What about bishop takes bishop here? Well, in that case, we can recapture with the queen and the rook is attacked as well as the knight. So that's winning for white. So e5 presents black with a few problems. So Daga took the bishop on e3, which was a recaptured by the queen, but now that kind of sorts out the position. You can see how important it was to play queen e2 rather than, let's say, queen e1, or you know, all the tactics fit together. So there's still a threat here. So pawn takes pawn on e5, f takes e5, recaptured, the knight is attacked, which came back to d7. So this pawn is under fire, so Spassky takes on b7 and queen takes b7. So the position has cleared a little bit and you can see that the pawn is now covered. The pawn has come to e5 and often that means that the e4 square is free for the knight. 
This is one of the big points of pushing with e5. But also we can see that the f file is now open. And, well, Spassky was very used to playing on the f file. We know that he loved to play the king's gambit. Black also has a problem because he's a little way from casting on the king's side. Casting on the queen's side is sometimes possible, but as the, the queen's side is so open that that is rather fraught with danger. Anyway, Spassky continued with queen to f4, threatening queen takes pawn check. So knight b6 from black. And, well, here's where you might like to pause the video and think, how would you play with white in this position? Because I think, what for me, what marks out this game is a couple of moments where Spassky plays a couple of really subtle moves. This isn't just a straightforward hack. I mean, at a certain point, it turns into that. But this next move is very clever. I think you have to think, what does black want to achieve here? Well, black wants to castle kingside. Spassky played rook d1. Well, it just looks like a good move, doesn't it? But actually, there is a specific point to this move. And, and the point is this, that to castle kingside, black needs to bring out the king's bishop. So if bishop c5... Because the rook protects the knight, then you can continue straight away with knight e4. And that presents enormous problems for black. Tax the bishop. If bishop takes, you recapture with the rook. Knight d6, check threatened. And if castles, then knight f6. Well, that's a mating attack straight away. So that's why rook d1 was played. It's a very specific reason. Now, black could castle queenside because actually taking runs into problems for white because of that pin. But knight e4 would be played anyway. Again, the rook defends the knight. That's important. And after knight e4, that doesn't look like a comfortable position for black at all. So after rook d1, Daga played knight a4. I guess that he was hoping after knight e4 perhaps to, to try and chase that knight and try and get some exchanges. But instead, Spassky exchanged knights. So, well, there's no longer knight e4 coming, but black has plenty of other problems in this position. And, and here is the next very subtle move that Spassky played. It's actually possible to sacrifice straight away. It's still not completely clear. But Spassky simply played king h1. This is a great move. And he's anticipating that Daga will want to bring that bishop out to c5. And then things start to happen. And it's a problem. Black wants to castle kingside. The bishop can't go to e7 because of queen f7. So bishop c5 is really the only other move. And now Spassky had prepared knight e6. Pawn takes knight, queen takes a4 check. Now, the queen has to interpose, and then queen g4. And with the bishop on c5, g7 is under fire, as well as e6. And you can see that, of course, Kingside casting is impossible because the rook cuts through on the f-file and likewise queenside castling impossible. So basically black's king is absolutely stitched up in the middle. But I really love that move king h1. It set up this sacrifice beautifully. Well, Daga played queen c6 to protect e6. Then queen takes g7 attacking the rook. Rook f8. Rook takes, rook check, bishop takes. And now simply queen takes h7. Sometimes in positions like this where your opponent has an extra piece, sometimes you can hang on. But here there really is no defense because 
well, white is checking with, with queen g6 and, and it's basically over. There is simply no good move for black in this position. Um, rook c8 was played. And queen g6 was the final move of the game. Daga resigned here. Let's just see why. Um, if king e7, then the winning move is rook d6. Attacking the queen, threatening queen e6 mate. And after queen c4, that protects the pawn, but then queen check and queen d7 mate, for example. So, uh, a very convincing win uh, for Spassky. That was the final position after queen g6 check. But as I said, I, I do like those couple of subtle moves that Spassky played. And, well, the amount of calculation he did there was superb. But... You know, if you played through this game without much reflection, then it just looks straightforward. But there was far more to it than that. Um, splendid game by Spassky. Do check out the other games in the Spassky playlist that I've recorded. Um, and thanks for watching.